Thank you, everyone. I'm Todd Weiler, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to my favorite room in the Capitol. And um, wanted to uh, welcome our um, special guests. We have Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson and her husband, Gabe. We have um, uh, Mandy's uh, family. We have Shauna Maine, Kent Maine, and Amos Maine. And we also are very pleased to have um, the family of the parents of Gabby Petito here, um, Nikki and Joe. So thank you so much for joining us, as well as some distinguished legislators, Representative Wilcox, Representative Ivory, and our minority leader, um, Representative Angela uh, Romero. Um, we just uh, uh, debated on the Senate floor, Senate Bill 117. We suspended the rules, which I want to, it's be kind of come uh, dirty language this year to suspend the rules, but our state constitution allows us to suspend the rules uh, with a two-thirds vote. And we did that in the Senate because with the Petito family flying out from Florida, I didn't want to have this big uh, debate and have this vote and then tell them, yep, and we're going to do it again tomorrow. So that is our Senate procedure, but we, we suspended that. We got a unanimous vote. We had um, Senator Brambo was off the floor. I, th I, I have every reason to believe he would have voted for it as well. So we're very pleased um, uh, with uh, the, the success. We also had a unanimous vote in the Senate committee uh, last week. And um, I just want to explain the bill does it does several things, but I want to emphasize the two main points with a little bit of detail. So first of all, um, there is a protocol that's been available, I think, since 2005. Um, it's, it's called the Maryland Protocol, the Lethality Assessment Protocol, or LAP, L-A-P for short. And I was first made aware of this, I believe it was 2013. I've lived in Woods Cross City for um, about 25 years now, and, and our police chief at the time, uh, Greg Butler, came up to the Capitol, sought me out, and said, will you help me try to get some funding for a pilot program for the, the LAP? And so I learned about this almost a decade ago and um, uh, never realized that that would you know, be a, maybe a, a moment that leading up to this. Uh, but what, what we'd like to do, we, as Lieutenant Governor and I and, and her, uh, the main family, is we've toured the state and made, w met with police chiefs and um, the commissioner of the uh, Department of Public Safety and judges and uh, defense attorneys and um, advocates for victims and others. Um, we've come to believe that one, one thing that may help us save lives and a lot of lives in the future is to mandate that when law enforcement, when the police get called uh, on scene to a domestic violence situation involving intimate partners. So if this was a mother fighting with her son or a, a father fighting with his daughter, we're not as interested in, in focusing on intimate partners. So this, um, I'll connect the dots for you, it's usually involving a sexual relationship. Um, in those situations, we're gonna mandate the use of the LAP, the 11 questions, um, uh, to the victim. and. Uh, uh, that should take about two minutes if it's done properly. Those questions are actually in the statute uh, because what we found was some police uh, agencies that were voluntarily using it, some of them used the Maryland model, some of them used other models, some of them only asked three questions, and, and we want to make sure we're all singing from the same hymnal, if you will. And so one of those questions, the first three questions are the most important and are the most indi indi indicative of, of maybe uh, p the risk of potential future violence. One of those questions is, has he, if the, if the victim's a woman, or if it's a same-sex couple, has he, if the aggressor's a man, has he threatened to kill you before? Another question I like to point out that's, uh, that's in there is, uh, has he choked you before? And it's interesting because statistically, if, if someone has choked someone, an intimate partner in anger, um, that, that there's like a 750% chance of, uh, of, of more violent behavior or death resulting. So that's, th th these questions are backed by some science and, and they're just not made up willy-nilly and they've proven successful in other circumstances. The second major point that the bill makes is we're gonna create a private database and I can't emphasize that enough because on the Senate floor I got a question about that. But a database, so the police when they respond and these are these domestic violence uh, situations are some of the most dangerous uh, situations our law enforcement um, uh, gets themselves into, and, and and I think some of the situations where they know that they're more susceptible to be injured themselves, that they could run the name of the of the aggressor and the victim through this database and find out if they've been involved in other intimate partner domestic violence situations in the past. And as Lieutenant Governor frequently points out. 
if I were to get pulled over on the freeway uh, on the way home today, which is very possible, if you know me, um, the, the police officer, before he got out of his car, he could run my license plate through, and he would immediately know or she would know if there was a warrant out for my arrest. We don't have anything like that for domestic violence. And in the case of, um, of Mandy, uh, Maine, um, we believe that as each agency received reports about her ex-husband, um, I, you know, it's, it appears to me that every time uh, this aggressor got the benefit of the doubt as, as if this was the first time that the two had had a problem because th there was different police agencies involved, especially in the 48 to 72 hours leading up to her tragic death. And so this database, the information would be collected and, and, and used, so there's some funding for that. There's some funding to make sure. Uh, one thing I, uh, important thing I skipped was if the answers uh, to the lap indicate that this victim could be in a potential of greater danger, uh, we would expect that the officer would immediately dial on his phone or her phone and connect them to services. If they're in the Wasatch Front, it might be a women's shelter. If they're in the rural areas of the state, it might be some therapist or counselor. Um, in, in any event, the database would be private. The information uh, from the lap, we have a score that uh, a judge might be able to, to rely on to, to decide if there's bail or pre pretrial release, uh, but it wouldn't be used for sentencing. So that's a brief description of the, uh, the bill. My House sponsor is here, uh, Representative Ryan Wilcox. He's the chair of the House Law Enforcement uh, and Criminal Justice Committee. Appreciate his support. He came and stood with me on the floor, and he also had the opportunity to introduce both the main family and the Petito family in the House today, even though we weren't debating the bill, and uh, both the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate uh, uh, conducted a, a moment of silence for, for, for these two families and, and, uh, and, and their losses. So with that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Deidre Henderson. Thank you. Um, today's a, a humbling day. I want to first start out by thanking Senator Weiler for his leadership. Uh, this has been a, an interesting past few months. Um, I want to thank my aunt Shauna and Uncle Kent and cousin Amos and the rest of the main family for their willingness to share their story, share what happened to my beautiful cousin Mandy, and turn their pain and their tragedy into something meaningful for other people. I would also like to thank Joe Petito and Nikki Schmidt, Gabby Petito's parents, for taking the time to be here, coming all this way. One of the things that um, there were a, a lot of things that struck me when we were all watching uh, when news broke about Gabby and she was missing in Utah. But one of the things that stuck out to me that I have thought about many times in the, uh, since um, last August when this happened to our family was Joe saying, this isn't just about Gabby. This has to be about every victim. This has to be about so much more than one person or two people, although it is about them. And I recognize that not every victim has a family member with connections like I have. And that has not been lost on me, and I take it very seriously, that responsibility that I don't just represent my family. I represent everyone in the state of Utah and have a duty to help everyone who may need assistance with domestic violence. I want to take a minute to acknowledge Representative Ken Ivory, who has done tremendous work in this space for a long time. It's a heavy lift. Um, there are other legislators, Representative Carrie Ann Lizenby, Representative um, Candace Perucci, uh, and others who have been working in this space for a long time. And of course, there are a, a lot of advocates and, um, and, and members of the executive branch, too, who, who care deeply. And I want to thank them and, and give them a shout out. Um, this is a, an important issue. If you look at the recent statistics that we have, which aren't all that recent, frankly, and uh, hopefully Representative Perucci's bill will help with this. Um, According to the latest statistics, almost 22% of homicides 
in Utah every year are intimate partner related homicides. And of those 22%, of those intimate partner related homicides, almost 60% of them are conducted by someone who has had a prior interaction with law enforcement for this reason. So we, with this bill, are trying to very narrowly target the biggest problem we have right now in the state with intimate partner violence, and that is to prevent intimate partner homicide. So thank you, all of you who've worked on this. Thank you to the Petito family, to the Maine family, and to all of the other families who have been affected by this terrible scourge. Thank you for being vulnerable, for sharing your stories, and for lending your voice and your muscle and your courage to making a change and making a difference for other people so that we don't have more women or men end up the way Mandy and Gabby ended up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Utah. You guys are leading the way. You're leading the way in. We lost Gabby. We lost your beautiful Mandy because of intimate partner violence and had this lethality assessment, which I've immersed myself in over the last couple of weeks, had been used. I know in Gabby's case, if it had been used, I believe she would still be here today. So we are proud to be here. We know she's not coming back and we can't save Gabby or Mandy, but Gabby and Mandy, we represent them and we hope that they can save more lives. And that's what we're gonna do. And we're so happy that it passed the Senate floor and we know it's going to keep going. So thank you. Um, I'll give it to Joe. So before I say, couple of things I would like to give everyone and if you're gonna write a story I want you to put these phone numbers in your story all right and if you're listening live or whatever you're, you're watching this on write these numbers down if you need the first is uh, Utah has their own domestic violence line that you can call and that number is 1-800-897-5465 or 1-800-897-LINK and then you have the domestic violence hotline, which is 1-888, I'm sorry, 1-800-799-SAFE. All right, so if you please put those numbers in your story if you're gonna write. All right, because those, those numbers can help, you know, the next person that's, that's gonna fall victim. Um, it is a proud moment to be here and I, and I thank everyone uh, for all the hard work that they did and the way that you voted today and that was awesome. Uh, I encourage the House to do the same but it's not just about the lap bill, all right? Um, these the questions are only the first step in the way of helping these individuals that find themselves in this situation, all right? And what, it's what comes after these questions that are just as important. You know, we had the privilege of speaking with Dr. Campbell and Dr. Messing beforehand uh, about, you know, these are the two individuals that helped with a team of people to create this program. And it's not just the questions that are important, it's what follows after, which is important. So I wanna stress that to the state of Utah and everywhere else that's watching. You know, the resources that you need to have, the advocates you need to have, the shelters you need to have, are just as important as these 11 questions. So when we found out that there's more animal shelters than domestic violence shelters, by a two to one margin, that's mind blowing. And I hope in the coming years that we can correct that and keep moving forward to where we don't know, when they're no longer needed. That's the goal. So I thank everyone, I really do. And if you need help, please call those numbers. There are people. The world is better today because you're in it. Love should not, you should not fear the ones you love. Thank you.
so grateful again for all of you to be here, grateful for the media coverage. Um, I love everything that Joe just said, um, and uh, I think that's, I wasn't aware, Joe, that we had twice as many uh, animal shelters as women's shelters. That's, that's embarrassing. Uh, we, we have to do better. Not, not to have less animal shelters, but we need more women's shelters, obviously. I, I can't thank the Lieutenant Governor and her family enough. Um, Lieutenant Governor and I were able to work together in the Senate for eight years. She is a tireless advocate and um, um, very persistent when she set, what sets her mind to a goal. And so I um, give her most of the credit for uh, the success that Senate Bill 117 is having. And um, with that, uh, are we going to take questions? Or All right. Um, so any questions we can have? Do you want to come up here? Let's OK. All right. Any questions? Oh, well, I think the Lieutenant Governor wanted me to mention that the bill has a fiscal note of just under $2 million, which has some funding, but that's accompanying um, a request uh, to the legislature for more funding. There's uh, about uh, 45 or $50 million in the governor's budget. We don't know that we'll get that much out of this year's legislature, but obviously if, if the police connect the, uh, the victim, let's say it's a woman, to services, and there are no services, that's not going to help. Just like uh, the Petitos were saying, we, this, you know, the, the lethality assessment's the start, it's not the end. And so um, that funding for services is, is very, very important. Well, I think, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I never knew Gabby. I didn't know her um, murderer either. Um, so I don't know the intimate um, details of their relationship. Um, I don't know if she had been choked before in anger. Um, I, I don't know exactly how um, she would have answered those questions. And had, had those questions be asked, I, I don't know what the police officer, um, uh, the police officers that intervened with her, what they would have done. It's, it's hard to know after the fact. Uh, let me just say this. Um, <laughs> I was so impressed with Joe when we met before the Senate hearing. He was quoting line numbers from Senate Bill 117, I had to break the sad news to him that I was substituting the bill on the floor so the line numbers would, would change. But one of the things that he pointed out, I think it was line 444 of the original bill, was that the questions would be asked in a non-accusatory way. If you watch the, the video interviews with Gabby Petito and Moab, which I have done, um, the officer was kind of warning her, you know, that the, the, the way that you answer this qu these questions uh, are, are going to determine what's going to happen next because if you watch those videos, th they were more interested in potentially arresting Gabby uh, for you know slapping Brian than, than they were in, in, in maybe investigating whether there was a bigger picture there. And, and I'm not here to point fingers at the Moab police. I think um, we can all use better training about domestic violence and what the signs are. Well, so first of all, I, I think, um, you know, with, with some very small exceptions, I think we have fabulous law enforcement here in Utah. And I think we're all kind of the product of our life experiences and, and of our training. And so um, I, I believe that if, uh, you know, first of all, new officers, as soon as this bill passes, they're going to get that training in the police academy, which we call POST. It's not as fun as the movies, um, <laughs> uh, the police academy movies, but we call it POST. So the new officers will all get this training, and I believe the other officers will get this training as well. So I fully expect um, them to follow the law because they're there to enforce the law. But um, obviously, sometimes you know there, there are mistakes made, human judgment. I mean, one thing that we haven't mentioned in this press conference that Senator Vickers alluded to on the floor is we had this uh, horrible tragedy uh, in Enoch um, recently where the oldest daughter was choked by the father and complained to that um, to the police and I don't think that they um, obviously didn't recognize that as a sign that 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 that, that was uh, maybe a harbinger of things to come and obviously she was not an intimate partner there but um, but that that um, I, if nothing else I hope that that tragedy in Enoch with with that family will make every um, all of us question what we can do more to help 
especially those, uh, th those individuals who work in law enforcement and respond to those incidents. Well, not between the father and the daughter. So if the, if the police had responded and, and determined that the mother was also being abused or was a victim, it would have, it, this bill would require it between intimate partners only. Question over here. Okay. Yes. The bill will require all law enforcement officers in Utah when they respond to a domestic violence situation involving intimate partners to ask the victim 11 questions uh, that are in the statute that, that comprise the lethality assessment protocol. Based on those responses, if, if there are enough yeses uh, and the th first three questions are heavily weighted, we would expect the officer to dial a phone number and immediately put that victim in connection with services, a women's shelter, a counselor, a therapist, what be it, and also warn the victim Based on your responses, we don't think you should go home tonight. We don't think you should sleep in the same bed tonight as this aggressor. The second thing it would do is it, it would create a database. And so when the officers go into these intimate partner situations, they're going to know within a minute or two if this victim or this aggressor have been involved in previous uh, incidents of domestic violence. And, um, and the, the, they will even know the results of the lap test that was given in, in, in a previous incident. That database will not be public. Uh, but it will be used for officers to make decisions on the scene, like maybe a, whether an arrest should be made or not, and also for judges. Uh, they won't have the exact responses, but they, they can get the scores and to, to determine if bail should be set, how much bail, or if, if someone should be held. So that's what the bill does. Um, it also provides some funding for services. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time and your interest. Thank you very much.